Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Within the context of an election that was characterised by a very partisan view of, of what the results were, you were sold and, and portrayed as, as being the one shining force for reason in the middle of this, the one person who looked at the numbers correctly. Uh, I mean, and, and how is that mantle? How is that mantle of the defender of truth uh, <laughs> so settling it's, in your shoulders? It's, it's inappropriate in one sense, which is that there are other people who had a similar approach, who tried to make some effort to look at at all the polls, and people all make different types of, of assumptions, but if you looked at uh, Real Clear Politics, which is a conservative-leaning site, uh, they had Obama in you know 48 out of the 50 states that, that we did, um, and called 48 out of the 50 states right, or, or other political scientists and economists and so forth. So it really was kind of, uh, it was not Nate versus the world, it was kind of people who were, who were trying to be fair and trying to actually look at, at the data versus people who were just making shit up. <laughs> <laughs> The, and it, what is it unusual, however, to, because this is a transparent system, we're taking the same information that anyone else has. These are clearly <coughs> what the, this is clearly what these polls say. If you turned on Fox News, I mean that's an extreme example. If you turned on sure. any of these shows, was <coughs> it frustrating? Were you beating your head against the wall, going for God's sake? Why are you not all? Why are you lying about this? So in, I used to play in poker, um, and in poker we have a saying called "Don't berate the fish." Um, and what that means, so a fish is a bad poker player, and. The reason why you play poker is because there are bad players and you take their money over the long run. So, <laughs> so if I were to criticize Fox News, for instance, or other sites that do poor job election coverage, then I wouldn't really have a, a viable business plan anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, I'd say there are, there are different views and people who are interested in, in feeling good in the moment and then kind of waking up on November 7th with a big headache and hangover, then they can, they can watch Fox News or read the Drudge Report, but people who are interested in knowing in advance what the probability and the odds are can, can read 538 or another site like 538. Explain to me the difference then, because uh, that ties into this. In the book, there's a, a section about foxes versus hedgehogs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and who would, who's, who's a wiser person to listen to in these situations? Sure. So, uh, so this is a characterization which was done by a guy named Phil Tetlock. He's a uh, psychologist at, at the Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania, and he did a a 20-year study of expert judgment. So who's an expert? Anyone who, who makes their living by, uh, by providing expertise on politics or economics, so academics and people who are on TV, people in government, people in think tanks. Um, he found that the average expert made predictions that were basically no better than random. Um, uh, they were better than those of undergraduates, though, for some reason. <laughs> it's possibly worse than random. Uh, uh, but, uh, but there were some who did a bit better, and they were the people he called foxes. And so the fox personality type tends to, um, tends to be scrappy and scrounge around for different ideas. They're not highly ideological. They're, uh, they don't have one big theory, but they try and, and they're very much empirical. The hedgehog would say that I have a big uh, theory. So, you know, for example, uh, um, you know, Karl Marx might be a hedgehog or Sigmund Freud or something, or maybe, uh, or maybe sometimes Malcolm Gladwell is accused of being a hedgehog with the tipping point and so forth. But having a, the theory that explains everything, kind of capital T, capital E, is a very hedgehog mentality. And if you have a pristine theory, or what you think is a pristine theory, then you have absolute certainty, so you think. But in fact, the people who, um, who demonstrate that overconfidence actually do, do a worse job of making predictions. And by the way, people who appear on, on television more often, this is part of the Tetlock study, also do a worse job of predicting. So every time you see me on the BBC or something, then you should lower your opinion of <laughs> how reliable I am. Sounds like I'd imagine how low the opinion is of me. Uh, so, <laughs> the, uh, so we should not trust people who have an overarching theory. But luckily you have your book here with your overarching theory of how, <laughs> how best, uh, though the techniques that you had with regard <clears throat> to sifting through this amount of information we have. I mean, the estimations were just for the sheer amount of information that we're going to be swimming in in the next while. It, and it's expanding, expanding all the time. So there's a lot of talk about, about big data and what that means. And you can, uh, you can draw a graph showing the exponential increase in the number of web pages or the volume of databases. Um, so IBM estimates that 90% 
of the data in the world was created within the past two years. Um, so there's an, an obvious, I think, problem here, which is that 90% of the useful knowledge in the world was certainly not created in the past two years. Uh, most of it is, is cat videos on, on YouTube, <laughs> in fact. Um, so of all that new information, which actually helps us make decisions better, helps us to predict things better, um, understands the real causes and not just statistical relationships that were valid in the past but won't carry forward as you move into the future. So weather forecasting is a case where people like to, um, like to make fun of the weathermen, um, but, but they do really, really well. Where over the long run, if you listen to, um, to the, like the UK, is it the Met Office? Or, Met Office, yeah. Uh, the Met Office or the National Weather Service in the US, when they say there's a 20% chance of rain, it really does rain one out of five times over the long term. You're still pissed off if you had a picnic scheduled for the one out of five, but those forecasts are well calibrated. Flip side of which, by the way, and it's also mentioned this, is when something serious has to be mentioned, for example, New Orleans, there's a section here by Katrina, the, uh, that whether people aren't taking that seriously. Um, so there is a kind of, so there's a real cost to uh, not just the failure, false negatives, right, where you fail to predict an event that occurs, but also false positive signals. Um, a lot of people in New Orleans who were older would remember um, Hurricane Betsy, which I think it hit maybe in 1967 or something, and still said, well, I, I wrote out that storm so I can write out this one. If there's a one in three chance of the worst case scenario, um, you absolutely have to evacuate people because the cost is, is so high. That still means your prediction is going to look foolish two out of three times. So it can be hard to persuade people to, uh, to act on, on this advice. When I said, for example, Obama, um, say on September 1st, was a 70-30 a favorite, you know, a lot of people thought that meant he was sure to win. It's like, no, it meant you know, Romney's going to win uh, three out of ten times if you could somehow randomize the world from, from that point forward, right? That's, that's quite a lot. If you had woke up in the morning with a three in ten chance of being stabbed, you know, you wouldn't really want to take those chances. You take that quite <laughs> seriously. Uh, so, but people don't, don't grasp that, I think, especially in events like politics where you're looking for uh, an election once every four or five years. And the other problem is that you've, you're, you're making predictions. There is generally the aim is to create a model that would pre predict correctly. So yeah, it's not purely. This is where I try and steer people away from thinking. Oh, it's purely a matter of uh, purely a matter of, of observing the data, and then it will become self-evident. Well, no, not not at all, right? Um, if you have good Bayesian priors is the fancy way to put it, but basically meaning a good, reliable theory that has been through the ringer and has been tested repeatedly. Um, often theories that are, are a bit more simple do ones that are overcomplicated. Um, then, then that's when uh, you can make a much stronger case based on the stats. Now, you mentioned uh, Bayesian there. You have a lot of Bayesian analysis here. Now, Bayesian analysis it would be different to the kind of just... Statistical analysis is what well, the Fisherian, I think, is the is that the the Fisherian is yes, a, yeah, it's an awkward yeah. term. Uh, uh, that's kind of the more drawing loose correlations between this event occurred, that event well, occurred. Well, not in theory, no, but in theory, it kind of tests things against a a, a null hypothesis yeah. and kind of how you define that. But it assumes that you kind of come into uh, to the experiment knowing knowing nothing at all about the underlying plausibility of a hypothesis. So one example is that. Um, in the U.S. for a long time, there had been a correlation between um, which team won the Super Bowl and how well the stock market would do. So if a team from the National Football Conference won the Super Bowl, the stock market had gone up some number of years and it went down if a team from the other American Football Conference won instead. And then in, uh, in 2008, the New York Giants beat the Patriots and uh, their team from the National Football Con uh, Conference and the entire global economy collapsed, <laughs> right? Um, so that's kind of what happens when you rely on a theory, look, there are millions of variables in the world, right? So the Federal Reserve, I think, now tracks 62,000 economic variables each day. If you want to look for two-way relationships, there are about 1.8 billion combinations to test. So you're guaranteed to find some correlations, but m many of them will be, will be spurious, like that Super Bowl indicator. Just, it's, and we have a tendency as humans to, sp to spy patterns in noise. Yeah, it's very hard for us to say, uh, oh, I don't know, you know, it's probably just random. We're really, really bad at doing that. In an evolutionary sense, we're trained to have very active pattern recognition skills. Um, it pays to make, uh, in the kind of the caveman environment, it pays to make quick inferences and have a fight or flight instinct, but we're not used to being uh, bombarded by as much data as we have today. And then there are also some less abstract issues, like, for example, in um, not just on television, but in, in academia, um, you know, your journal article is more likely to be published usually if you, if you say, well, we provided definitive proof of this 
hypothesis, right? And the next paper comes out and says, no, this is totally and completely wrong, right? Tweaking like two assumptions and so forth. And you don't have this fox-like tendency to say, well, if you look at a problem one way, um, you get this result, and you look at it this way, you get a different result, and so this is kind of interesting, right? Like that humble approach is usually how, how science really is. If you have a complex data set, there's some interesting observations that, that you take, but they depend on your assumptions in part, so you develop new hypotheses and, and subject those to scrutiny and to testing, and then science kind of evolves slowly and not always in a forward <laughs> moving direction. It's with fits and starts and occasional steps backward. Um, and that's hard for people to accept, especially if they are uh, built up as being as being experts, right? It's hard to, to go in and say, what will economic growth be next year? You know, well, the correct answer is, uh, you know, somewhere between negative 2% and positive 4%, right? Um, so anywhere is about as well as those forecasts have actually done historically. But if you're uh, David Cameron's economic counselor, then you can't really say that and, and keep your job probably. Yes. But does it, by the way, if you make the, the fr if your initial presumption is really bad, Mm -mm. Does this kind of analysis correct it? So in theory, that's the other thing that Bayesian thinking does, is that you have a prior belief, you get some new evidence or run a test, and then you update your belief. And in some cases, they can update quite quickly. So for example, if you were in New York on the morning of September 11, 2001, um, you would initially probably assign a very low probability uh, to the World Trade Center being, uh, being down by, by terrorists, right? Um, but, but once the first plane hits, that piece of information is so definitive that the probability estimate goes, goes way up. And when the second plane hits, you're absolutely sure, or 99.999% sure, that's not a coincidence, and it, it converges toward, toward one. The UK pander sports analogy, right? Okay. If Arsenal are playing Chelsea, right, and, uh, and Chelsea have scored three goals and Arsenal scored once, right, then a lot of the US media would write, you know, both sides have scored some goals, either team could win. You know, who knows what will happen, right? So just this mere act of just not even taking an average, just counting the polls. By the end of the election, you had, um, you know, probably nine out of 10 polls in the swing states had Obama with the lead. Um, and, and the news uh, channels announced that was, they're all giving us the same story. Some polls say X, some polls say Y. So yeah. who knows what will happen? So just, you know, counting things. It's not, I mean, averaging, <laughs> gosh. But just <laughs> counting things is, is sometimes beyond the capability of, of some of the news media, I think. Because there is a, there is, I have a, it's a personal book of mine, it balance, the, no, the illusion of balance, that yeah. you have to give equal representation to two sides of a, of a debate, when in fact, one side represents 99.9% .9 of, of a consensus view. That's right, and, you know, and there are challenges when it comes to representing the debate over, uh, over climate science, for example. In fact, in some fields, um, I have a lot of respect for, for science journalists, um, but you do have this issue where sometimes the, the research finding, um, which is pumped out by a university press office that has an outlier result, some highly implausible um, alternative therapy to treat cancer or HIV that has not become part of the consensus um, or even part of the debate really will, will get a bigger headline than, um, than the paper that, you know, something is retracted <laughs> later on or something, just, there's disagreement in science and, uh, and not just replicating experiments, but, but because when you are working with statistics, um, your assumptions do matter a lot, that kind of seeing what different approaches yield and how robust the theory might be. But how it, much of your thesis is people are stupid? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think, well, I don't think people are. I'm not saying put it on the cover. It's not that uh. people are, it's not that people are stupid, it's that people aren't as smart as they think they are. So you can be very smart, but, but, uh, but, uh, but not be quite as smart as, as you assume. So yeah, I mean, it's a lot of the, the book, the thesis is about kind of, you know, what are the limitations imposed by, um, by human nature, really. Um, and we are our own constraint, <laughs> basically. Um, and the idea that, oh, you just kind of build a computer program and the computer will solve everything, well, that's still designed by, by a human being, right? The human being writes the code. If you put in silly assumptions, the acronym is garbage in, garbage out. You put it in silly assumptions or introduce a bug into the code and you can, the computer will faithfully replicate that silly instruction um, and, will, and will reproduce that bug millions of times over. 
we should be humble about our own ability to perceive the world, especially uh, complex matters like forecasting earthquakes or the economy or, or, or what have you. Well, there's a tendency to believe of, uh, in, in that science delivers laws in a very immutable way that E equals MC squared and that's it and it's the law, when in fact most science does, most science is. Most science doesn't, and there, yeah. you know, we mentioned astronomy before where, um, where you know, Newton's laws turn out to be a case where things are extremely elegant, um, but that's not necessarily true if you look at quantum physics, for example, where it's very uh, counterintuitive in, in a lot of ways. So people, you know, um, there are things to be said for, for simplicity, um, in part because a simpler theory, um, there are fewer things you can, <laughs> you can muck up potentially, um, but at the same time what really matters is how well something makes predictions in the long run. One thing, my kind of philosophy is, again, uh, uh, not to say that people are stupid, I think people are very smart, right? But looking for fields such as politics where, where some of the more stupid people tend to congregate is a good way to, <laughs> to look at by comparison, right? So I'd rather be kind of a, a, someone who's merely competent um, in the world of the blind, deaf, and dumb than to actually have to, have to you know, beat the entire stock market. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Nate Silver. Thank you. It's a pleasure.